he, I think, will be uh, really fun. It's kind of a different type of sermon or lesson. We're going to talk about how to put together a sermon. Amen. So many of you are going, well, I never preach, and so how is this going to really help me? Well, it will help you be a better communicator, mm-hmm. but I think also it will just help you learn how to put together even a Bible talk, if you put together a Bible talk, and communication skills that make this uh, really effective. Um, can someone kind of close the door for, for me there, too? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So we're going to really get into this, guys. We're going to talk about being effective speakers. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Right now would be a good time to turn all the cell phones on silent and all that good stuff. Technical term, I'll give you some theological terms today, is homilet- homiletics. Homiletics is, means simply the art of preaching. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to go to a Bible college and uh, learn about really the art of preaching. And uh, I'm going to give you a lot of technical terms and different things today and different types of sermons that you can preach. Um, and I'm really excited to see what our movement's doing. Hopefully you read the bulletin about the new ICCM. Amen. And so I really believe we're going to be able to start even more fully equipping our ministers and our preachers to preach. And we've always always had a great uh, system of preaching because, bottom line, guys, you just got to be with Jesus and be discipled if you want to be a great preacher. Are you with me right here? Amen. They saw the apostles. They said, these are unschooled, ordinary men That's right. um, who had been with Jesus. And so if you're close to the Lord and you walk and you tra- train by another man or man, another woman, you're going to become a great preacher for God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. The charge here is that before God, we preach the word. Before his kingdom, before his appearing, we preach the word of God. He says that we got to be prepared in season and out of season, when it's popular and when it's not. We still are charged... To preach the word. We've always got to be prepared. Because it says that there is going to be a day, and we are living in that day, guys, when many teachers will arise and they want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. I mean, maybe you see some of these televangelists that get on TV, like Joel Osteen or different people, and they, they, they just kind of tell people what they want to hear, right? What their itching ears want to hear, that you're a good person. Just think positively. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. God totally is loving and graceful. Just think positively, right? Such a great message. Sounds good to me, you know. It's what my itching ears naturally want to hear. As preachers of God's word, we've got to preach the truth, right? So I've got four points today, and they all come from this passage. Number one is presence. We've got to preach in the presence of God. Number two is preparation. We've got to be prepared. Number three is persuasion. We've got to be persuasive because there's all these different doctrines out there. So we're going to have to persuade people towards sound doctrine. Amen. Mm-hmm. And then number four is power. There's got to be a power when we preach. Look in Acts chapter 14. Acts 14 and verse 1. You're going to have to keep up with me a little bit here. Verse 1, it says, At Antioch, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Wow, so the Bible teaches that the effectiveness of our speech can be proportionate to the number of souls that are saved. Do you guys believe that in your hearts? The effectiveness of your communication will directly be proportionate to the effectiveness of the number of souls that are saved in your ministry. Because Paul and Barnabas were great speakers, they were able to attract and bring in many people into the kingdom of God. But our first point is we're talking about presence. You see, the Bible teaches that when we are in the presence of God, when you stand up before his people to preach, 
You're preaching before God. Mm -hmm. Two things take out people from having effective speech. Number one is insecurity. And number two is fear. Really, they're both kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Many people, when they get up to preach before people or, or give a Bible talk or give a communion lesson even at church, uh, they're worried about what people will think about them. Yeah. I remember as a young preacher when I came to Portland and started preaching, I remember when Kip was sitting there in the front row, you know, I'm just going, oh, man, I, 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 what's he thinking? Why is he looking like that at me right now? You know, sometimes he'd be preaching, he kind of look like this. I go, okay, did I say something wrong? You know what I mean? I wasn't preaching before God, right? Amen. And so the challenge is that when we preach, we've got to preach in the presence of God. And when you preach in the presence of God, it takes away any sense of insecurity or thought about yourself. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. We cannot be consumed with what people think. We are preachers sent and charged by the living God who will judge the living and the dead. And it says, in view of that, that's how you preach the word. Amen? Amen. Do you consider that when you give a Bible talk, when you lead a Bible study, when you're sharing the word of God with people, that it is in the honor of God and in his presence that we preach? Amen. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to get into all the structure and all the details here in a minute, but we're just talking really about the heart first. Talking about the heart. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look in verse 7. The evangelist Paul writes to our preacher Timothy, or the apostle Paul writes to our evangelist Timothy, in verse 7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, other translations say a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. You know, the word enthusiasm, literally in the Greek, means God within you. So right away, as the preacher preaches, there's got to be a power that comes from within. Are you with me right here? Because that's literally what it means. God inside of you enthusiasm you can write down john chapter 7 verses 37 through 38 but jesus talks about how when the holy spirit would be given it would be like this this waters these bubbling waters that would bubble up from inside and literally come pouring out are you with me right here it would be this mighty river that would literally come from within for the one that has the Holy Spirit inside of them. This is the power that we're to have. I think uh, one of the challenges, and there's different extremes we can go to when we're preaching. Many people don't really prepare their sermons or have any kind of structure or any kind of notes because they go, well, the Holy Spirit's just going to kind of work as I preach. <laughs> Some people, they think this is just being more real. And, and, and the challenge that we got to have here is that the Bible says the Holy Spirit that's been given to us is one of self-discipline. Mm -hmm. It's one of order. And for whatever reason, maybe it's the influence of the Pentecostal church or whatever, sometimes we have this idea of like, well, I'm not really going to prepare and I'm just going to let God say whatever he wants to say. And sometimes that's not God saying whatever that wants to say. That's just you're undisciplined and you're saying whatever comes to your mind. And sometimes it's not very good. With that being said... The Holy Spirit can still work. But how does the Holy Spirit work? It works in the order of self-discipline. So you have a great plan. And then as you carry out your plan, sometimes, guys, I, I preach about things I didn't even prepare to preach about. Sometimes I have things written down that I don't say. For whatever reason, God is leading when you're in his presence. When you're preaching in the presence of God. So as you prepare a sermon... You want to remember that you've got to be planned out. It's not time just to, to let whatever you, you're thinking say, you know, just come out. Or uh, You want to have a great plan and be effective. Enthusiasm means God is within you. Do you believe that God gave you the spirit of self-discipline and power that you don't have to fear? Well, if you look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, our second point, and this is where we're going to get into how do you prepare a sermon. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 11, the Bible says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. 
What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. So the Bible teaches, guys, we're supposed to try to persuade men. Are you with me right here? That is, is your primary goal. So as we talk about the second point is preparation. We're going to lead eventually into persuasion, but part of being persuasive is preparing. You have to have a great sermon, and this takes a lot of preparation. There are three keys to persuasion of an audience that Aristotle talked about. Three keys, and I want to talk about these. Number one is what's called ethos. Number two is logos. And number three is pathos. Eth ethos uh, comes from, you know, it's the Greek word for where we get our word ethics. Um, ethics for the disciple is, is your ethics, your life, right? It's the authority by which you speak. So we're talking about ethos. Look in, if you will, in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, ethos here. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus was perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Never sinned. So his life example, guys, and the way he lived his life preached louder than any words he would ever say. That's right. And one of the things you got to have a conviction of is as a preacher, your life has to preach louder than any words you ever say. Right. right away, your ethics, if you will, your lifestyle as a disciple is going to carry weight to whether people listen to you or not or are persuaded by you. In Matthew chapter 7 here, and we'll have a time for questions later. Matthew 7, if you look in verse 28, the Bible says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Some of you think when Jesus taught as one as authority, that just means, you know, he preached real loud and was very authoritative. <laughs> well, that might be part of it. But authority here, I believe, is just talking about he had the lifestyle that backed up the fact he was the son of God. And so what he said counted as something, and it was different than the hypocrites, those Pharisees. Because they preached one thing, and Jesus goes, yeah, maybe do what they do, but don't do, do as they live. You know what I'm saying? Do what they say, but don't live as they live. I mean, these guys were hypocrites. You know, when you preach the word, your lifestyle counts for something. If you can't pay your bills and you have a hard time keeping a job and then you want to get up and talk about living a godly lifestyle, people are going to be like, amen. And it's a spiritual thing sometimes. Sometimes people won't even, you know, intellectually understand that, that you're, you know, you're a derelict or whatever. Uh, but if your life doesn't match up, it doesn't have power to it. This is, this is ethos. And even Aristotle, a pagan in the world, understood this, that your ethics... It means something. We see this with great leaders. I mean, when we find out scandals come out and stuff, it's hard for us to listen to what they want to say. Our politicians or trust what they want to say, right? Yeah. And so our life, our ethics got to count for something when we preach the word. Does your life demand authority? Does your life demand authority? Number two is logos. Logos is the logic behind the sermon. You know, uh, I don't know about you guys. Do you guys like movies? Yes. I mean, think about it. What, what keeps you into a great movie? The story. The story, exactly. What else? The actors, the actors okay. What, what else? <laughs> the plot makes sense, right? You can follow it. The story. I don't know about you. I love a good twist. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love at the end being like my mind blown, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And I'm just going, whoa, where did that come from? I still remember when I saw Sixth Sense, you know, just oh, going, yeah. oh, my gosh, what yeah. what in the world, you know? Uh, or like the others when they had the, the, I don't know, I watched all these scary movies back in the day. But just the, the endings would just be like shocking, you know? Uh, that's a, a great sermon, guys, has a great logic to it. The preacher's taking you on a journey, and it's like you're in this great movie, and, and there's twists and there's turns, and it all comes together for a climax, and you're just like, man, my mind is blown. That, that, that's, that's a hot sermon right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's got to tell a great story. and It's got to have a logic to it that makes sense. You know, sometimes people can ramble on. They can go on tangents. It doesn't lack, it lacks basically cohesiveness. 
And so people are lost. They're trying to follow what you're trying to say. It can be confusing sometimes or um, out of nervousness. Sometimes people just talk and say things. It doesn't even make sense. That's one of the things I've had to work on the brothers in the campus ministry. They, sometimes they'll be leading Bible talks, they'll say things, and I just go, I have no idea what the heck that's, that means. <laughs> it, it, it lacks, uh, 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 it, it's, it's just confusing. It's all out of insecurity and just fear. But it's got to have a logos or a logic to it, a plot, a story. It, it, it tells a story. We're going to talk about how to create that in a moment. Thirdly, it's pathos. Pathos is the passion that we have. I'm telling you something. If you ever get behind God's pulpit and you preach a sermon that's boring and puts people to sleep, you are in sin. <laughs> I mean, how, number one, how is God's word boring? And so it's not at all. And so if someone makes it boring, oh, my gosh, what a front the floor. You know what I mean? There's been times, guys, I preach and I see people are starting to kind of drift off. It's been about, you know, almost an hour or something. I just got to go, you know what? I just got to stop where I'm at because, you know, something. It's more important that God's message gets, gets through. We're going to talk about timing and different things here in a minute. But pathos is has got to be a passion. You can't speak monotone. Isn't the word of God living and active, Hebrews 4, verse 12? So, so as a prophet of God, as a prophetess before the Lord, don't we have a responsibility to make it alive and to make it active? Amen. This is not being fake. This comes from your relationship with God. We've got to display a passion. We've got to be larger than life when we preach the word because that's what's going to draw an audience in. Every time I preach, I always try to preach a jubilee type sermon. I don't go, oh man, you know, well, it's only like 15 people here and so I'm going to kind of just preach a little lesson. No, I give 100% every sermon I preach. I 100% believe it's like we're at a jubilee or something. I'm not going to give some weak sauce sermon and make it boring uh, because the Bible teaches that we've got to deliver with passion and we see even Aristotle understood this with his uh, pathos well now we're gonna get into some technical stuff here so hang in there with me there's three types of sermons uh, that scholars have said that that you can preach three types they really fall into these three categories number one is what's called an expository sermon expository sermon um, an expository sermon preaches through portions of the Bible. You could take a passage or a paragraph, and basically the expositor, this is basically someone who digs in and pulls out the truth out of the passage. So an expository sermon would be you'd read a passage of sermon, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a passage of scripture, and your sermon would come from the passage. You're digging out the truths of what the Bible teaches. This is different. You're not just coming up with something you want to preach and finding scriptures to help support that. You're looking at the text and you're reading it and you're saying, what can I dig out? What was the theme here? What was he trying to say to the original audience? Um, what's the message here of the scripture? And all your points that get dug in out come from that passage. This would be like what Matt's doing with the Roman series. It's okay to have other scriptures that help support the points. You can do that. But the point is, is an expository sermon goes through at least, at the very minimum, a, a couple verses, a passage, um, or even books of the Bible. Um, this is the best and most mature way to preach a sermon, I believe. Because what it does is it preaches through the entire Bible, and it, it really gives you a couple strengths that we're going to go over in a moment. But this is expository. Remember, once again, it means you're digging into the text and you're pulling out truths. And it allows your sermon to develop around the text. The strengths to expository preaching. Number one, God's message comes through, and I believe it's really spirit-led. Why? Because your sermon is coming from the Bible. It's not your topic, and then you're finding Bible to support it. It, number two, it brings a balance to the congregation. For example, if I only always preach just topical sermons, and we're going to talk about what topical sermon is here in a moment, but if I just kind of always preach what I want to, want to preach, I'm typically probably going to most likely preach things that I like preaching personally as a person. And so the whole church is going to be only balanced with what I like preaching. So if I'm really into eschatology and end times and revelation and stuff, which I am, um, 
that's all the sermons are going to be on because that's what I love preaching about. And so then everybody is going to be, you know, we're going to have this church where people always fear Jesus coming back and his wrath and stuff. And they're not going to know anything about his grace or his plan and stuff because I don't, I'm not an expository preaching. I don't preach through the Bible. Are you with me right here? So the goal, one of the things we believe as a church is that we've got to obey the whole Bible and bring a balance to the church. Preaching expository will challenge you to know your Bible. Because you have to go through books, you go, man, I don't really know what this is. It takes more preparation. So a strength is it brings balance to the congregation. Uh, another strength is it teaches the congregation the Bible, so we become a Bible church. There's always weaknesses to all types of sermons. And so when I say these are weaknesses, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do this. So a couple weaknesses are um, our culture is becoming more, what should I say, uh, it's like a fast food type of culture, quick. And so expository sermons can be difficult for the current culture. Something that we've got to wrestle with as leaders right now. Number two, it can be challenging for new preachers to preach expository because it requires knowing how to study your Bible. Number three, it takes more time to prepare an expository sermon. Number four, another weakness is it, is it boxes you in sometimes. I remember one time I was going to preach through the Mark, book of Mark for our devotionals on Friday night. But there were so many needs mm. in the campus ministry Amen. that the, it just really didn't meet at that po- moment. We were a brand new ministry. I had, to, I had to just stop it. You know, I preached like the first two parts and then I was like, all right, uh, we're, we're not going to go through the book of Mark. Amen. So, so sometimes it can box you in or trap you. A good example of an expository sermon you can write down, Acts chapter 2, of course, is where you know, the kingdom starts and Peter preaches there. And he uses a, a, a lot of text that he preaches from to explain that Jesus is the Christ. Secondly, the second type of sermon is what's called a textual sermon. Similar to expository, yet different. This type usually develops a single verse or two of scripture. And the theme may come from this verse. But the other verses support the theme, not necessarily the text. So what do I mean by all that? 1 Corinthians 13, 13 is a good example, right? It says that uh, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. You remember that? And so a, a, a topical sermon might be, you title it, the three that remain or something like that. Or, or you could call it the greatest you know, attributes or whatever you want to call it. And then your three points would be faith. Hope and love. So the text breaks down your sermon. This is a textual sermon, although you may now have more supporting verses, and these supporting verses won't necessarily, um, you know, exegete the text, so to speak. Another um, example would be in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I believe it's at the very end there, where Paul says, uh, uh, you know, be full, let nothing move you, uh, do the work of the, of, of, of the Lord. I'm totally misquoting it. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> trying to remember here. I'm like. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Yeah, that wasn't on my notes. The Holy Spirit's moving, guys. Look at this. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. It says, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So you could title your sermon um, something like unmovable, you know, and then you could have your first point would be let nothing move you. Or you could say your first point is stand firm. Your second point would be give yourself fully. And your third point would be your labor is not in vain. And so you, you break down the, 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 the whole point of a textual sermon is the, the, the little verse you choose or the couple, two verses you choose uh, break down the theme and then you find verses. You could do one text, one verse that just says, Moses was a servant of the Lord. And your whole theme would be, hey, the servant of the Lord. And then you'd find scriptures to support that. It's simply like a textual sermon. So you're using a text to convey a theme. Does that make sense, guys? A good example is uh, Paul and Barnabas do this in Acts chapter 13, verses 46 through 49, if you want to see a good example of a textual sermon in the Bible. The strengths of a textual sermon is, number one, it sets the sermon up for you. So you don't really have to do much. It breaks it down for you. Um, 
you could say uh, the title of your lesson, you could do Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And you could, the title of your lesson is The World Evangelized. And the first point would be go. The second point would be make disciples. The third point would be baptize them. And the, the fourth point would be teach them to obey. You get what I'm saying? That, that, that's another example of a textual sermon. Another strength uh, is these are good for weddings and funerals. Um, and other events, graduations, ceremonies that you may be asked to do to give a sermon out that they're not meant to be too long, but at the same time, it gives a great theme for the event. Um, another strength is these are good for short charges. If you're asked to do a 10-minute charge or a 15-minute charge at a Jubilee or, or, you know, sometimes you get these little time limits and you have to give a great little, little sermon there. The weaknesses are they usually lack depth. Not all the time, but sometimes. They're theme-oriented. Those are a couple of the weaknesses. The last sermon, the third type of sermon, is the topical sermon. This is the one that's probably the most popular in our church. Um, and there's many reasons for that. We're a new movement. Um, most mature evangelists don't preach topical sermons. So you'll see Matt, for example, usually doesn't do topical sermons a lot of times. He usually does text textual or even more expository type sermons. Topical sermons, basically, you develop a topic or a subject that it's a, a subject or a topic that the preacher chooses, and then you find scriptures to support it or a scripture to support it. And so this one starts with the, the, the mind of the preacher and then goes to the Bible. Not necessarily a bad thing. Our first principles are topical. They're pretty awesome, right? Of course, these have been researched, and the context has already been divided by, by the people that wrote them. And so all the studies already done. Are you with me right here? Um, but, but one of the things that, that a topical sermon um, has strength in is it meets the needs of the congregation at times. Sometimes when you have a crisis in the congregation, sometimes there's just certain things you just got to go, okay, we got to go there and talk about. Right. And so you have a topical sermon. Um, I did a topical sermon last night at our devotional on uh, spiritual war, talking about angels and demons and these sort of things. That, that was an in-depth topical sermon. Yeah. Uh, most topical sermons probably won't go that deep, but, but the, 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 the challenge was, as I saw that, that we needed to get more of a conviction on prayer in the ministry. Uh, and we, needed, we started our prayer warriors ministry, and so I came up with a topic, and then I, I came up with passages and different things that supported it. A lot of sermons I've done before, but um, these are strengths. Uh, another strength for a topical sermon is that it hits specific needs, and also it's great for new preachers. And so if you're brand new at preaching, topical sermon is really what, where you want to go and what you want to do. The weaknesses of a topical sermon is your thoughts come first and then the Bible. You just always kind of roll the dice with that because you could be wrong. Number two, topical sermons, if that's all you do, it brings an imbalanced message to the church. An imbalanced message. Number three, it doesn't force the preacher to mature. Right. So if you always stay with topical sermons, um, you may be the, the hype, zealous, fired up guy all the time, preacher topical, but your sermons lack depth, and so the people lack depth, and you build even an emotional church sometimes yeah. that doesn't have depth and maturity, and so uh, the church is, is just kind of all based on hype and, and this sort of thing. Topical sermons are great sometimes. They have great strength. Within topical sermons, there's a couple more sermons. There's about three sermons that could fall under a topical sermon. Um, there's a historic, what are called historical sermons. Historical sermons deal with recapping history. So at our new members orientations, many times, uh, Matt or Kip or different people will do this. They'll go through the history of the, the church mm -hmm. and of God's movement. That's essential. You got to know your history. Acts chapter seven is where Stephen gives a historical sermon. He goes literally all the way from the, the Old Testament, the beginning there with Abraham and all that stuff and Moses and all those guys, all the way from the beginning in Genesis, all the way through to what happened to Jesus. Pretty awesome, huh? And it's a challenging sermon. At the very end, you know, he ends his sermon, he goes, you stiff-necked, you know, rebellious people, and they stone him. <laughs> I mean, he's willing to pay the price, like Matt talked about, for proclamation. That's a historical sermon. Uh, the remnant sermon I did the other day, remnant theology, that, that was a historical sermon. 
it goes through history and, and, and you're teaching something so that you can draw out truths and learn from your history. Number two is biographical sermons. You can write down uh, Matthew 12, verse 39 through 45. Jesus gives kind of a sermon. It's more of a speech, but a, a, a biographical sermon. He talks about Jonah. And he talks about how day is. Jonah was uh, in the well for three days and then spit out to life there. Uh, Jesus, he goes, the Son of Man will descend in the earth as well and die and then be raised in three days. Uh, so in a sense, he does a, a biographical study. This would be like you do a sermon. Hey, guys, we're going to study out David today. And we're going to look at David's life. And the title of my sermon is A Man After God's Own Heart, you know, and then, you, you know, you can have three points about David and this sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yep. So you pick out a character to study. Um, in some ways, the, stu- the sermon I did last night also kind of borderline um, uh, biographical because we, we studied out Satan and his biography and, and where he came from and his mission and this sort of thing. It's also a little bit historical. Number three is testimonial type sermons. This is where the sermon's about you. <laughs> so if you want to preach about you, you want to do a testimonial type sermon. Now, now it's not necessarily about you because it glorifies Jesus and how he changed your life. Uh, these are some of the most powerful sermons because people can relate to them. Uh, it's modern day. You're, you're bringing out your life. You're being honest about who you were before Christ and how Christ changed your life. Paul does this many times. You write down Acts 22. Paul preaches about his life. He preaches about how he became a Christian in hopes that uh, the Roman government there and whom he's talking to and the, the different people, well, in, in, in Acts 22, I believe he's, he's not in front of the Roman government. Yeah, that's Acts 26. Sorry. But, but he, he shares his testimony three times in the book of Acts. It's a testimonial type sermon. Some people wonder um, about how to take notes. I've had many people ask sometimes when I get done preaching a sermon for my notes. Sometimes I'm like, you really don't want to see my notes, you know, because it can be confusing. Everyone, how they take notes is going to be different. Uh, I would suggest taking notes. Um, Notes are important. Now, here's the thing about notes. Whatever you preach about, you need to know it in your heart so that if your notes got ripped up or you, you know, forgot it that day or something, I believe you could still preach it. It may not be to the extent and all the stuff you need to remember and you may not know some of the scriptures and stuff, but you could still convey the heart. Are you with me right here? I even thought that when I was driving here, I kept having this fear that, that I forgot what I was going to talk about in my, my bag. And I was just like, well, you know, I'm almost here now. It wouldn't really matter. And I was just thinking about like, man, you know. Could I preach what I'm preaching this morning now without notes? And I go, yeah, actually, I think I could. Because uh, I know it. It's in my heart. I, I may not have some of the terms or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But you can convey it. You've got to know your sermon on your heart before you preach it. If you depend on your notes, I don't believe it's in your heart or your conviction. So, 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 so you've got to know it before you write it down. Uh, you can write down. We're going to talk about some more terms here. I want to talk a little bit about the study life of the preacher, the Bible study life. This is huge. Most of your sermons will come from your personal quiet times. That doesn't mean your quiet time is a time where you put together your sermon. But that means that a lot of your personal devotion, your study life, the the, the, the amount of depth you have in your personal quiet times is going to be the amount of depth I believe you have in your sermons. There's a word you can write down called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is knowledge that deals with interpretation of the Bible. Hermeneutics, in a broader sense, can be uh, interpretation of any literary work. Sadly, because of Satan's fall, there is interpretation in the world. And even as disciples, if we're honest, sometimes we interpret the scriptures. Now, the Bible teaches there is no private interpretation. Um, that what God said, that's just what he means, and we just got to shut up and obey it. Are you with me right here? Right. So people get caught up on these theological debates trying to figure out what this means and what that means and stuff. And, and as preachers, we've just got to be honest and say, hey, listen, you know what? If that's what the Bible says, we just got to obey it. And, and if, you, you know, if it's, we're silent and it doesn't talk about things, you can have your own opinion and stuff. But we're not here to preach opinions. Amen. We're here to preach the word of God, right? Amen. Now, sometimes you will talk about your opinion or you'll talk about different theories that, that, that you may have. There's some things the Bible aren't clear cut about, but it's, some things just make the most sense. And so I'm very careful when I preach things that make the most sense and aren't clear cut in the Bible to say, hey, this is my opinion and usually offer the alternate view. So that way it allows the audience to go study it out for themselves. Are you with me right here? 
So even last night I preached a sermon. I talked about how uh, some people believe demons are fallen angels, and some people believe, like me, that they're 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 uh, uh, spirits of, of disembodied beings from a long time ago. Whether or not whatever is true, the Bible doesn't say clearly. It suggests, and I believe it points to something, and you can argue a persuasive point, uh, but you got to be clear about these things or, or people can get stuck in viewing things a certain way. Are you with me right here? Yeah. So hermeneutics is the knowledge that deals with the interpretation of the Bible. The next word is exegesis. Exegesis uh, is where you exegete the text. You read out the meaning from the text. So uh, we all do exegesis every day when we study the Bible. We're trying to find out the meaning of what the scripture is trying to say. The meaning in the text. This is exegesis. In dealing with exegesis, there's many what, what, what people call uh, criticisms. Uh, scholars call these different criticisms or ways that we take a critical look at the Bible. Now, criticisms, guys, isn't like when I'm using this word criticism, I'm not talking about being critical and questioning the Bible. You get what I'm saying? Uh, I'm talking about being critical in a healthy way that, that develops your study life so you can get deeper in the Bible. Are you guys with me right here? Amen. So one of the criticisms, the first one's textual criticism. This is where we, we go on a quest in our personal Bible study for the original meaning of the words. What the original intent was of the text. Uh, you're doing what's called word studies. Um, a word study is basically where you take a word and you find out what did it mean in the original language. So in the New Testament, the New Testament's written in Greek. The Old Testament's written in Hebrew, right? Yeah. And you say, well, I don't know Hebrew and Greek. Well, good, like, I don't either. Amen. <laughs> Took a class in Greek in, in Bible college. Didn't really keep any of it. Um, the, the, this is awesome because today we have so many websites and different things that can help you out. You write down blueletterbible.com or studylight.org. These are just two of the websites, blueletterbible.com or studylight.org, where if you notice certain words that stand out to you and you want to find out what they originally meant in the Greek, this website's awesome. You type in the scripture, you put your mouse over the word, and boom, <laughs> you're done. Back in the day, guys, preachers had to like have like you know linear Bibles for this stuff and Strong's Concordance. <laughs> so it take hours, you know what I mean? Uh, God has, has really worked in the sense that now we have all this technology that we have access to. But that's textual criticism. You're trying to find the original uh, meaning to the word. So when you read a text in the morning, you want to see, are there any words that stand out? Wow. Here in you know Corinthians 1 here, uh, he uses the word Lord a lot. I keep saying Lord. Well, what's Lord actually mean? What's the literal meaning? How would they have understood it back then? Secondly, is historical criticism. You want to know the, the, the timing of what you're reading, the setting in its time and space. So this is, is, is doing some research and finding out what the customs were of that time. What was the culture like? Well, you know, so a lot of times it's, it's, you're looking into Judaism, right? Um, you might research the, the Talmud. You know, you might research uh, some of the different uh, religious customs and different things they had. But even outside of Judaism, if you're doing like the first century church, you need to know kind of the Roman Empire culture at the time as well. Because these cultures clash with one another and have directly impacted uh, what you're reading in that moment. You guys with me right here? Yeah. And so we're talking about exegesis. So we talked about textual criticism. Now we talk about historical criticism. And that's a quest for knowing the setting and its time and place. Next is grammatical criticism. This is the, the language of the text. You know, many times, guys, Paul is, is being sarcastic. <laughs> and you can tell by, by the way that the grammar is written out. But if you don't know some of the grammar and how it's written out, you, you're not going to know kind of what, what, what the punch is. Why, why did the NIV translators put an exclamation point at that point? Uh, you get what I'm saying? You want to know the grammatical language of the text. The next one, and probably one that's very important that, that I think disciples, you know, we can get jacked up on sometimes, is uh, literary criticism. In our quest sometimes, uh, well, you know, we believe, guys, the Bible is the literal word of God, right? Yeah. But once again, there's literary criticism, meaning that all of the 66 in the Bi books of the Bible aren't the same type of literature. So, for example, the book of Psalms is what we call poetic, right? When God says, hey, I want to hide you under the shadow of my wings, we don't go, oh, wow, 
I get to hide under like feathered wings that God has. You get what I'm saying? Now, if you read Psalms the way you read Genesis, you would think that because Genesis is a historical narrative. It's, it's literal in the way you're supposed to read it. If you read Psalms the way you read Acts, Acts is historical narrative. It's, 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 you just read it. It's, it's, it's just what it says. It's literal. You take it for what it says, right? You can tell the genre by the way you read. Revelation and Daniel and Zechariah um, aren't historical narrative and aren't 100% literal. If you read it like that, you're going to get in trouble. You'll think there's only 144,000 people going to heaven. You'll think Satan's a you know, seven-headed dragon or whatever. You know, on, right? you, you, that, that, that's, that's, no, he's not Jedediah. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is what's called apocalyptic language. And so it's written in a, in a, a symbolic manner to convey truth. So all the colors mean something. White's purity, you know what I mean? Red's uh, bloodshed and persecution. and The numbers mean something. Seven's perfection. Ten is total, uh, uh, um, total totality. Twelve is perfect government. You know, I mean, all the numbers mean something. And you got to understand and do some research a little bit uh, to figure this out. But there's been so much damage done by people not understanding literary criticism. And so they'll preach revelation very literal. And people are trying to figure out when Jesus is exactly coming back. And, and, and it, it gets people jacked up because they don't understand literary criticism. So when you read the Bible, you need to know what type of literature that you're reading. Is it poetic? Is it narrative? Is it apocalyptic? Next is tradition, tradition, uh, traditional criticism. This is the traditional interpretation. Now, this isn't the most important, but, but you got to give it some credence, guys. You should look at how have people traditionally interpreted this passage. So a lot of times you'll find great Christian uh, thoughts. We don't know if they're, you know, probably not true Christians, but uh, great Christian thoughts through, from guys like Augustine, um, John Calvin, you know, uh, Martin Luther, different people that, that, that but have come before us and did incredible amounts of research on these things. Uh, many uh, scriptures have traditional readings. For ex example, last night I didn't talk about Isaiah 14 and Satan's fall. That's traditionally how that passage has been interpreted. Some people say it's not even talking about Satan. And there's a chance they could be possibly right. It's talking about Babylon, the king of Babylon. But then there's other modes of interpretation. You understand like the law of double reference. And so you can look at scriptures and go, okay, there could be a dual meaning and dual prophecy to this, just like Isaiah 53. So these are things you learn as you dig deeper in the Bible, guys. I'm not saying like right at the beginning, you know, if you preach a sermon, you got to know all this stuff 100%. You know what I mean? Um, you got to start somewhere. But, but these are things you want to look into and find out what was the traditional meaning? Uh, how have people traditionally interpreted this? Finally, and there's many other forms of criticism. These are just some of the ones I think will help. Uh, there, there, there's a, a canonical criticism. This comes from the word uh, canon. Canon is, is what we call the Bible. It's a canon of scriptures. It's a canon of books, right? collection of books. And so you want to interpret the passage or the text you read, say, how does it fit in with the rest of the Bible? So there's some strange passages in the Bible. You read 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about baptism for the dead. You know, what in the world is that talking about? Well, you got to look, okay, is it mentioned in the rest of the Bible? No. So, okay, could Paul possibly be using maybe hyperbole or, or trying to prove a point? You get what I'm saying? When you look at the rest of the Bible, you can kind of start to look and go, okay, is this a one-time occurrence? Why is it that the Holy Spirit only falls and they, they speak in tongues and that sort of thing only in two places in the entire Bible? And Acts 2 and Acts 10. If you have canonical criticism, you're not going to arrive and think that still exists today. You're going to look at the rest of the Bible and see what the ultimate plan of, of God is. But sadly, people don't understand this. They don't take the entire Bible and, and, and uh, deduct the scriptures that way. So a couple of keys I'll give you to your study life. Number one, read the context of the passage. So when you read a passage um, that you want to preach on, read the entire context, guys. Know, know, know what, what, the, what the author is talking about. What's he trying to address? Number two, look for common words, words that stand out. Are there, are there words that keep being repeated? If you find words that are repeated, do a word study on them. That's, that's, those are those websites I gave you earlier. Number four, ask, what is the author trying to get across? Many times you've got to kind of think backwards. So, for example, we read earlier when Paul told Timothy, God did not give you a spirit of uh, timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Well, what do you guys think Timothy was maybe struggling with? Fear, right? Fear. <laughs> So you got to think backwards, like, okay, why is he saying to this church, you know, don't be immoral, 
Uh, man, there's a lot of things about sexual sin in Corinthians here. Hmm, I wonder what they struggled with. <laughs> a lot of people in sexual sin, you know what I mean? Um, and so you got to think backwards as you read uh, the passages. Number five, read commentaries. Now here, once again, you got to be very careful. Uh, commentaries, guys, some of them, uh, almost every commentary contains false doctrine and jacked up stuff. That's right. <laughs> But I'll tell you something that's going to force you to get dig deeper in your Bible. And this is how you're going to know how to start thinking about critically about the scriptures and know the context, the background, the history, uh, different dates. Always encourage people to get conservative commentaries. You don't want some of these liberal commentaries that just get you to doubt the Bible. You want to get a conservative commentary uh, that believes the word of God is the word of God. So now we talk about structure. I want to share uh, something that, that's really important. Uh, when it comes to the sermon. So here we get some, this, this stuff is huge right here, what we're about to talk about. Uh, Abraham Lincoln one time uh, heard a sermon preached. And it's interesting, he was walking out of the church and someone comes up to him and, and he goes, they go, hey, uh, Lincoln, I don't know if it was when they were walking out of the church or later on or whatever, but, but he goes, hey, uh, to Lincoln, what'd you think of the sermon? And Abraham Lincoln goes, it was powerful. It was eloquent. It was powerfully delivered. I mean, he just, he just was like, it, 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 it sounded great. And he goes, but it failed. And the guy goes, well, well, how did it fail? He goes, it failed to call me to do something great. Wow. And, and, and fundamentally, that's where preaching fails all the time. You can be eloquent. You can be powerful. You can have people laughing. You can have people crying. But if it doesn't call them to do something great, you failed. Great preaching calls us to do things we never thought we could do. When you leave the room, you feel like, man, I am going to change. I know practically what to do. So number one, I always start my sermon. You want to think of a call to action. What's the one thing I want people to walk away from on this sermon? For example, this Sunday, I'm preaching uh, an expository sermon on Luke chapter 15. The one thing I want people to do in that sermon is to set up a personal Bible study with a non-Christian friend. That's it. If every single member of the church sets up a new Bible study with a non-Christian friend, that's going to do major damage to Satan's kingdom there and prosper the church. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Is that, that, that's my call to action. Sometimes the call to action is, hey, I want to challenge you to raise your contribution. Sometimes the, the call to action is, I want to challenge you to get reconciled with one person that you're not close to. Sometimes the call to action is, I want to challenge you to confess that sin that you've been holding on to. There's a call that moves everyone to action. Are you with me right here? Amen. Once you have the call of action... Number two, your three points should all support that same call to action. Sometimes we have to have, we try to have three different calls to action. The sad thing about that is that most people can't handle more than one thing. Yeah. They really can't. What was my call to action last night in my sermon? Well, dude, if my, if my calls to action were in all the points and stuff, you couldn't handle that sermon. I had one simple call. We all got to become prayer warriors. We got to be on our knees praying. Yeah. That was the call to action to get everyone praying. Uh, I think uh, these three points should all support the call. Sometimes, too, guys, you can be creative. You don't have to say my three points. You could say my three calls to action, or you could say three things that are going to help you to have a healthy marriage, or you could say three things that are going to uh, – you get what I'm saying? You don't have to always say points. Number three is you need to figure out the theme of your sermon. So you got the call to action. you got the three points. So what's the, what's the whole theme? Well, that's where once you know the theme – then you can come up with a great title. When you're choosing your title, it should grab people's attention. Maybe a popular movie's out. I mean, one time I preached a sermon called Twilight New Moon. <laughs> and, you know, it, based on Colossians there, where, or top, based on the Bible, biblical concept of the New Moon Festival and, and stuff. But, but uh, one time I preached a sermon called 300, you know, uh, dealt with Gideon and his man, the 300 story in the Bible, not the, the, the movie. But, but it grabs people's attention. You with me right here? Yeah. Um, the title should be very powerful and should convey the theme of the sermon. Number four, after you've got this basic structure down, you want to insert illustrations into your sermon. I believe every point should at least have a good illustration. An illustration could be a quote. It could be a story that you heard. There's great websites that have great like preachers illustrations you can use. That literally you can type in topics. Um, one's Bible.org. Um, has many illustrations. You go there, you'll probably read it and go, oh, I remember Mike said this story one time. Um, th th these are good stories that are out there that preachers use. 
Um, one of the things is, is you've got to have integrity. One of the things I lacked uh, when I first started preaching was I lacked a lot of integrity. And so I would, I would tell stories like they were my own. Um, and that was one of the things I had to repent of. Is that, you know, if you're going to use a story that's somebody else's, give the credit where it's due. Mm-hmm. Now, if it's a preacher's story or something like that, 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 that's just a story that could be true, that's fine. You can say, hey, I heard a story one time, but you're not saying it's your story or it happened to you. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Um, another thing, too, is that uh, uh, these illustrations can convey things from your own personal life. But one of the things you got to be very aware of is sometimes you don't want to make the sermon all about you. Mm-hmm. And, and that can become a temptation. I think the other thing, too, is when you share from your personal life, make sure it has a victory ending. You don't want to say, oh, man, I've been tanking it, you know, with my purity, and so I can kind of relate to what this is going. Anyway, let's move on to the next scripture. Everyone's going, oh, man, I mean, you just, you lost all ethos right there, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it, it should have a victory kind of ending. It, it should be closed at the end. Um, I think you want to make the text alive, and so you want to use stories that are going on in the church. People should see that the scriptures are being lived out in the church. You want to lift up other brothers and sisters in your sermon. The preacher should be able to connect with the audience in a way that's powerful. Are you with me right here? Um, number six, you want to use an icebreaker for your introduction. Now, icebreaker, guys, guys some, many preachers try to become comedians and stuff like this. <laughs> be yourself. Uh, it's okay to be funny sometimes. But that shouldn't be the thrust of your sermon to where the message gets lost. But uh, an icebreaker, good introduction, um, could be a story that you start off with. You start off, hey man, guys, I want to share a story about blah, 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 and you tell, and then the story comes in with a dramatic point. Sometimes a good introduction is just getting right to business. There's been times I go, guys, today we're going to talk about hell. Let's turn to Luke 16. Everyone goes, whoa, doesn't really require much of an introduction. Are you with me right here? Uh, And so it just depends what you're trying to introduce, but it ought to grab people at the beginning. Um, whether it's a story or a scripture, I believe you should have power when you start off at the beginning. So you want to come up with power. Good morning, guys. You guys fired up to get in the word of God today. Yeah. You can do that stuff. Sometimes the church is kind of dead. You need to wake them up a little bit, you know. I do that last Sunday, unfortunately. Uh, I was like, hey, who's the most fired up here in the room? You know, blah, blah, blah. I'm just trying to get people awake and engaged, you know. I don't enjoy doing stuff like that. Uh, because ultimately, your introduction should be good enough to capture people without having to do stuff like that. I didn't have a great introduction to my remnant theology. Um, so I want to encourage you guys to have a great introduction. The last thing is your conclusion at the very end. The conclusion should review the three points and then have the call to action. Are you with me right here? Review the three points and have the call of action. Well, we've been talking about the third point, persuasion. And look at Acts chapter 2. Almost done here, guys. About 10 more minutes. Look at Acts chapter 2. You remember the sermon when uh, Peter comes and preaches the first gospel sermon? You remember that, guys? Yeah. In Acts 2, um, he preaches starting in verse 14. And notice what he says. He says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice. Okay, so we learn right away. You got to raise your voice when you preach, right? Guys, we should practice this. Uh, When you're sharing good news sharing, I encourage you, work on your speech. Some people share good news sharing, and they're just so quiet, you don't know what they're saying. They're kind of like, you know, and you're going, what? be powerful in your speech. Raise your voice. Amen. So he raises his voice. He goes, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, live, uh, let me explain this to you. He uses a, a personal pronoun there. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. Drop down to verse 22. Man, Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you. By miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you. Do this. You yourselves know. You, 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 you. Eventually, he closed out in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Sometimes as preachers, we get too politically correct. We go, hey, we all are in kind of in this together, you know. No, you're the prophet of God preaching the words. And you got to say, hey, you crucified Jesus. You've been in sin, and you need to repent. Are you with me right here? A hypocritical lifestyle makes you lose that confidence. But the person that's walking with God can confidently be able to, like Peter, make it personal. The best sermons I've heard have been the ones where I feel like he was following me around all week or like he somehow knew my sin or my disciple or talked to him somehow or something. You know what I mean? I go, oh my goodness, he's talking like right to me. A great preacher makes everyone feel like that. Because he goes, you need to repent. He, he is invested in the Word of God, and the Word of God meets us 
where we're at in our lives. So one of the keys is you got to know your audience. I don't preach the same way to the campus ministry that I do the whole church. Because I'm a young guy still, and so in the church I have older people, and I can't just talk to them like I would a campus student. Um, I have to win the respect. Are you with me right here? Um, the, 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 there's a difference in your audience. Sometimes you're preaching to a bunch of non-Christians. If I'm preaching at Bible talk, I've got like 20 visitors and like seven not, you know, Christians there or something. A sermon's going to be a lot different than if I'm just preaching to you know, a bunch of disciples. If I'm preaching at a leaders meeting, if I'm preaching at a staff. There's a huge difference in what we talk about and what we preach in. So you've got to know your audience so that you can connect with them. You can I'll write down Acts chapter 17. Paul knows his audience. He preaches here to a bunch of non-Christians, philosophers. Guys that uh, many people say were the first evolutionists because they believe their idols evolved from the ground. And so Paul uses a much different approach. He doesn't go into all the scriptures and stuff. He goes, hey... God created everything you see. He relates to them. He goes, there's this idol that you have called to an unknown God. He goes, this is the idol I'm going to talk about. And so he uses their current culture to bring a message of God to them. And then at the end, he calls them to repent. He even quotes from some of their own poets. He goes, we are as offspring as some of your own poets have said. So as a preacher, should you be caught up on modern events? Absolutely. You should read the news. You should know what's going on. I mean, uh, one of the things that I'm going to preach about Sunday, I don't know, but you heard this meteorite that, that hit down in Russia there and about 1,000 people were in, injured. I go, dude, you could be walking and a meteorite could come and you could be done for. Yep. And yet we're not ready for Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this comes with knowing current events um, going on. So be up to date on current events. And this can be a challenge sometimes. For example, uh, I'm not a big sports fan, you know? Uh, but sometimes I kind of just got to know what's going on a little bit so I can relate to my audience. You know what I mean? I'm an uh, anomaly when it comes to that. Uh, Peter uses the word you uh, around almost 15 times. He uses personal pronouns there in Acts chapter 2. He appeals uh, to them. He also, at the end, in verse 39, appeals to their family. He goes, the promise is for you. And for your family, your kids, your children. He makes it personal, guys. Sometimes you got to go there when you're preaching. Go, dude, if you don't become a disciple, what's the hope for your family? It strikes a personal nerve. You go, oh, man. It goes there. Persuasion is what we're talking about. I think we got to win an uh, uh, audience over. And we got to be willing to say hard challenges. Uh, Hitler, you know, <laughs> not a great example of a preacher. Uh, but, you know, he was an effective speaker. Yeah. And one of the ways he won people over is he always usually had three points. And two of his points he preached that everyone would agree with. Two things that everyone was fired up about, and you know. And then he would throw in one that people were like, I'm not so sure about that. But they were one and up over by the first two. They, you know, they go, okay. I mean, guys, can you read the horrific events this man got people to believe in? That's like the most satanic. <laughs> I mean, wow. Satan's a great persuader, and he learned that from God. Because he counterfeits everything God does. How much more persuasive, how much more, as Jesus says, shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves should we be when we're preaching the word of God? Uh, uh, sometimes you, you want to make your points mostly inspirational, but maybe you have a hard challenge in there so that it wins everyone over. They go, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, this is fired up. We're going to evangelize the world. Okay, that 15 times missions contribution. Okay, I can get behind that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you're persuading. Finally, uh, the last point is power. Look in 1 Corinthians 14. Two more scriptures. 1 Corinthians 14. You guys, this helping you guys out here? Yes. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24. Just kind of getting a behind-the-scenes look at how you put together a sermon here. And 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24. As we're turning there, guys, uh, a life of study is so important. Uh, even putting this together, I, I, I've been convicted. Sometimes I can get so busy, and it's easy to just kind of like, oh, man, i gotta, I got to preach tonight at Devo, so I'm sitting there, you know what I mean, like just trying to get it done, you know. Uh, uh, that's not how we should do I mean, I'm fired up. I already got my Sunday sermon written for, for Sunday morning, you know. Uh, it, it should take time in, in prayer, and we should, we should pray before we write these things. We should take time to really consider and think about it. Because ultimately, here's the result we want. 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 4, 24, the Bible says, But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody's prophesying, 
He will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. He, so he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. One point I'll say really quick is that when you read the scriptures, guys, whatever you're going to preach on, you want to have read the, the verses before you preach it. Yeah, you. I've seen some people get up there and they're saying words and they don't know what the Melchizedek, you know what I mean? They're trying to say words. That, that you lose power and people lose respect. Yep. Uh, you want to be able to know how to pronounce things. And so it's good to read through some of these bigger words. But when people come to church, this is what it should look like. People are convicted that they're a sinner and that they need God. And they say, God is really among you. Now, they may not say it in those terms, but they know, dude, there is a presence here and something is powerful. Are you with me right here? We are to preach with power. How do you bring that power to a room? Well, number one, you've got to be right with God. And as Jedediah would say, your space has got to be clear, right? We're all spiritual beings. When you walk into a room, you, I believe, bring an energy. I'm not talking about new ages. I'm not talking about some weird karma thing or anything like that. I'm talking about a spirituality that brings, I mean, when Jesus walked into a room, you knew he was there. Amen. There was a presence about him. Look in Ezekiel 39, or I'm sorry, Ezekiel 37. It's our last passage about preaching here. Uh, the word prophesying, by the way, doesn't, sometimes we think that just means predicting the future or something. That's part of it. Uh, prophesying is communicating God's words. So in Ezekiel 37, in verse 1, we read this amazing vision. I talked about this with my D group the other night. It says in verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor and in the valley bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man! Can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Can you imagine? I mean, many times in the Bible, people have visions. But in this one, the Holy Spirit actually takes him into the vision. <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. And so he's walking around. There's, there's all these dead bones laying around everywhere. And God goes, Ezekiel, can these bones live? He gives <laughs> probably a smart answer for where his faith was at. He goes, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. <laughs> Um, when we preach, we got preached in faith. Ezekiel lacked faith here. He didn't really believe they could live. I mean, that's kind of like saying, I used the example the other day of, of, you know, man, this brother keeps on being impure and looking at bad stuff and, and all these things. I mean, God asked him, well, do you believe you can be pure? God, you alone know. Oh, <laughs> Lacks faith. Of course the bones could live. As a preacher, you got to believe anybody can change. Anybody can change. You know why I believe anybody can change? Because I changed. <laughs> God changed me. It was all God. I couldn't do it on my own. Um, so now I am convinced 100% anybody can change, no matter how demonically possessed, no matter how much sin's in their life, no matter how dark, Jesus Christ can change their life. And you've got to believe that 100% about what you preach. So when you go in, you preach with faith. Well, look in verse 4. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath, it can also be translated spirit, enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Great preacher does what he's commanded, amen. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and the tendons and the flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So he starts preaching the word of God. And the Bible says that all these bones start rattling together. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean, dude, when you preach the word of God, sometimes there's going to be a little rattling and a little ruckus and a little, little frustration. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I've had people come up and talk to me after I preached before and they're, they're a little ticked off about something I said. Uh, the bones are rattling a little bit. But now the bones come together and you have structure. But the structure lacks something you're going to find in a sec. It lacks life and power and spirit. You see, sometimes you can preach and you can have great structure, but there's no power in it. Look what happens. It says there was no breath in them. Verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. I mean, guys, in the Orlando International Christian Church, 
we're going to see a vast army raised up that takes Orlando for God. And as Jesus said in the white rider there in, in Revelation, we are bent on conquest and soldiers for the Lord. Amen? Amen. This comes by a powerful preaching of the word of God. And when you preach the word of God, he says, prophesy to the breath. And call the breath, this is the Spirit of God, to come from the four ends of the earth and come into your message and come into these slain. You got the structure, now they just need life. Are you with me right here? I've got to bring, you say, how do I bring the Spirit? Is this some mystical thing? No. Jesus says, my words are life and my words are Spirit, right? That's right. And so when you preach the Word of God, you are bringing the sword of the Spirit that's going to slay any deadness in your church. Does that fire you on up in the Lord? Yeah. And so four things we got to know if we want to be great preachers. We've got to be in the presence of God. Amen. Number two, we've got to prepare. you got to be prepared. Part of becoming a great preacher also, guys, is imitation. I don't have time to talk about it, but one of the ways I learned to preach was just by imitating Kip. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. I encourage you to look at a great preacher who you admire and just imitate what they do. I would literally preach Kip's sermons to a T. I'd change some of the illustrations because, you know, talk about Elena or different things, you know, so I'm not going <laughs> to share the same stories. Yeah. Make it personal, but, but you imitate a great preacher. So you stand in the presence of God and preach before him. You're prepared, and then you're prepared to persuade and then you bring the power of the Holy Spirit. And with that, I believe you can have a great sermon. My challenge and my call to action for you today is your homework assignment. Is to prepare a sermon outline for next Sunday. Or next, um, what's today? Saturday. Um, to prepare a sermon outline. So you'll want your title. You'll want your introduction written in there. And you'll want your three points. And here's the thing I want to challenge you with. I want to encourage you to write bullet points. I don't, I don't want you to write, so you can do Roman numerals or the A, B, C thing, whatever. Um, so each point, for example, each three points, I didn't really get into a lot of this, should have subpoints in it. And that's where your illustrations and stuff go. But I want to encourage you to, to just write it the way you would write it. Sometimes I've had people try to get me to take notes the way they take notes in Bible college and different things. They kind of explain how they, I just, I, you, you got to find a way that works for you. One thing I don't want you to do, though, is don't write a, 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 a paper. Some people have tried to do that, and they just read from a paper when they get up there. Don't do that. Write some bullet points down that you can look at, and then you can go in and preach. And maybe next week a couple of you might end up preaching it for a couple of minutes. Um, I don't know. I mean, talk to Matt about that. but <laughs> Just wanted to keep you on your toes. <laughs> so, amen. That's uh, uh, you know powerful preaching. Um, and so I pray, and we're going to have a time here in a moment uh, for some questions. But I pray... Uh, these things helped you um, in learning to preach the word. Amen? Amen.